Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, we'll get busy and uh, wind up with program number four this afternoon, and uh, we can be heading home. For those of you out in television, if you ever like to be part and parcel of a taping afternoon, we usually tape, tape, not always, but usually on the first Wednesday after the first Sunday or the first full week of the month, and uh, we'll be glad to have you. Just call and make sure that come on in. we got plenty of room. Again, we always like to appreciate your prayers and your letters, your financial help. <coughs> everything that makes the ministry possible. Okay, we're going to continue right on where we left off in our last program. <clears throat> and again, in case we have someone who has missed the last two, three programs, we're going through a study of the covenants, which started way back in the Garden of Eden, where God mandated the environment, the responsibility of Adam and Eve in the Garden, and then the fall. Then he uh, lays out the program for life in the human race under the curse, and uh, that has carried on until our present and will until the end of the tribulation. All right, now then the next covenant, as I mentioned at the beginning of our last program, is in the middle of the seven that take place between Adam and the kingdom. And I'm going to come back and study that more in depth in a future program. But we'll just touch on it briefly in this program before we move on into the next covenant, which would be the Mosaic. In other words, the bringing about of the law of Moses. But let's just take a brief look at the Abrahamic, and uh, like I said, we'll come back to it in detail at a future program. Genesis chapter 12, starting at verse 1. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said, I'll slow down a little bit, some of you are still looking. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. All got it? Now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country. Now remember, he was clear down there in the area of the Persian Gulf, uh, probably south of present day Baghdad. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, that is your, your household, your relatives, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Now the first thing I always like to point out is what kind of people were Abram's family. Now the best way to explain that is use scripture. Keep your hand in Genesis. We'll be right back. Come up with me to chapter 24, verse 2. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 2, because we have to get the big picture as we go along. These things then just happen in a corner. <clears throat> Joshua 24, verse 2, And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, your forefathers, dwelt on the other side of the river, that it be the river Euphrates. Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the river in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, the father of Nahor, Abraham's brother, and they, the whole family, the whole community, the whole then known world, served what? Other gods. Now do you see that? That was what? Idols. Paganism. That's all they knew. Now, you want to remember, 200 years previous to the call of Abraham, you had the Tower of Babel. And it was at the Tower of Babel that false religion was first introduced by Nimrod. And from Nimrod on then, the whole human race, now you want to remember, you're only dealing with that small part of the world at that time, in the area of the Middle East and the Mediterranean, but they were all steeped in idolatry. They knew nothing of the one true God. And so it was for that reason, now then you can come back to Genesis 12, that God had to separate this separate man that he's going to use to bring about the nation of Israel. 
he had to separate them from his idolatrous relatives. So he told him to leave your kindred, go from your father's house unto a land that I will, future, show thee. Now then, here comes the covenant. And we're going to watch it carefully before we move on and, like I said, come back at a future program. God says in his covenant promise now, I will make of you a great nation, separate from all the rest of the nations of the world. And I will bless thee. And I will make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that curse thee. And curse him that curseth thee. Isn't it too bad that the world can't believe that? But you see, if they did, that would spare Israel all the satanic attacks. And that is not going to be stopped until Christ returns. But nevertheless, this is all the promises in this Abrahamic covenant that God will bless those who bless Israel and he will curse those who are against Israel. And then here comes the, the capstone of the whole covenant. This last part of verse 3, that in thee, in Abram, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that. What does that mean? That through this man Abraham, God is going to set things in motion that will lead to the place where salvation will then go out and encompass the whole human race. And that's why I want to spend more time on the Abrahamic covenant than all the rest of them put together because it's on this covenant that our salvation rests. It's because of this covenant that Christ came. It's because of this covenant that Christ suffered and died. It's because of this covenant that the Apostle Paul came on the scene and became the Apostle of the Gentiles. And that's why Paul over and over refers to this man, Abraham. And so that's the Abrahamic covenant, and we're going to come back to it at a future time. Now I'm going to go ahead to the next covenant on our board, and that is the Mosaic, the covenant that God made with Moses and the children of Israel. Now we're going to jump all the way up to Exodus 19. Now in the interval, of course, we have the beginning of the nation of Israel with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then the 12 sons, Joseph is sold down into Egypt as a slave by the 11 others. And that, of course, separated Israel from the promised land. It put them down in a place of slavery. It put them in a place of subjection to pagan, ungodly rulers, and out of which God had to redeem the nation with the book of Exodus. And we now find the nation at the Mount Sinai, ready to receive the next, what should I call it, foundation of the next covenant, the law. All right, but let's just pick it up in verse 3. Exodus chapter 19, verse 3. The nation is now out of Egypt. They're gathered around Mount Sinai, and God, of course, is showing his presence on the mountaintop with thunder and smoke and fire. Verse 3. So Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and thus shall you tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, that is a reference to the drowning in the Red Sea, and how I bear you on eagle's wings, not that they sprouted feathers and flew, but supernaturally, miraculously, God led them out of Egypt and through the Red Sea and down to Mount Sinai. It was a supernatural event. All right, I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now here the language already indicates whose people are they? They're God's people. They're his covenant people. And he has mandated it as such. And we're going to see that now in the coming verse. Now, therefore, 
since I have brought you out of slavery, I have supernaturally brought you to myself. If, here's the condition now, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then, and only then, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above what? All people. Now, right there is the beginning, then, of God elevating the nation of Israel head and shoulders above all the rest of the nations and races of the world. This is why they are called the favored nation. They are called the chosen people. They are God's covenant people. And here is the first real indication of it. All right, then verse 6. And you shall be unto me... I didn't finish the verse. I'm sorry. You shall be a treasure unto me above all people. And here's the reason. For all the earth is mine. What does that mean? He can do what he wants. God is sovereign. Now, you know, I learn every day. The other day somebody called and said, Les, do you know the word sovereign isn't in our Bible? Now, you know how often I've used it over the years. I said, no, I didn't know that. And so I had to look, and he was right. The word sovereign, like the word trinity, is not in our Bible. But certainly all the evidence of what sovereignty means is here. So I don't have to stop using the word, not at all. But, you know, it's interesting. Here I've been using a word that I thought was as biblical as anything could be. But it's true. It's not in our Bible, but certainly all the meaning of it is. And here is one of them. If all the earth is mine, what does that mean? He's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. And this is what he chose to do. He chose to pick this one little nation of people and set them head and shoulders above all the other nations of the world. And he's going to work through that one little nation. All the rest of humanity, as I've used it before, it's just going to flow like old man river to the ocean. And they're going to have nothing to do with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for the most part. There will be isolated exceptions. Now, the verse that Paul writes that exemplifies that so beautifully, keep your hand in Exodus, come back with me to... Ephesians, had to think for a minute. Ephesians chapter 2. A lot of times people kind of look at me cross-eyed when I let it be known that the Gentiles were never the object of God's grace. The Jews were never instructed except to go to Nineveh. They were never instructed to evangelize the Gentiles, but quite the opposite. They were to keep all of these knowledges of God. Boy, what a word. I coined one, didn't I? <laughs> all of these things pertaining to the knowledge of God, they were to keep to themselves. They weren't to share it with the Gentile world because God was not in the business of saving the Gentile. And a lot of folks just say, where do you get that? Well, because of language like we've just seen here, but here Paul himself places it. So easy to understand. Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. This leaves no room for any great number of Gentiles coming to salvation in the Old Testament economy. It was impossible. Verse 11. Wherefore, Paul writes, and remember he's writing now to Gentiles at Ephesus. He said, Wherefore, remember that you being in times past, what? Gentile. Now maybe for the sake of one or two listeners out in television, I better stop. What is a Gentile? Well, in plain language, he's anybody who is not a Jew. A Gentile could be an Arab or a black or an Indian or a Caucasian or you name it. If they're not members of the nation of Israel, they are Gentile. Now, you see, all the way from Adam until Abraham, you don't have any particular Jew or Gentile separation. These are all just simply of the race and the birth of Adam. They are what I call the Adamic race of people. But now with the call of Abraham, setting out one little nation separate, and he calls them Jews or Israelites, the rest are Gentile. And so from Abraham on, we have that difference in Scripture of Jew 
and Gentile. All right, reading on in Ephesians. So remember you Ephesians, and of course the churches around them, that you were in the times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision. Now what was that? That was a deriding term. That was the scorn that Jews had for the Gentiles. You're called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision or the Jew. Now verse 12. See how plain this is? That at that time, while God was dealing with Israel under these covenant promises, that at that time you Gentiles were without Christ. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the what? Covenants of promise. That's why we're studying them now today. The Gentile world were strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and what? Without God in the world. Now, what does that mean? They were lost. Every last one of them, they were lost. Well, it wasn't God's fault because they had proved for the first 2,000 years they didn't have any interest in the things of God. They had proved by their idolatry out of which Abraham came that they weren't concerned about a knowledge of the one true God. They were satisfied in their idolatry. And look, at that's the vast majority of people today. They're content with their false religion. They're content with no religion. They're not interested in real salvation. And it's always been this way. All right, so the Gentile world then was totally separated from all the covenant promises of Israel. All right, now then back to Exodus 19. We can pursue this a little further for the next few moments. How that now God is going to supernaturally invoke the covenant promise of the religious system of law. Now, most of you know I do not like the term religion. Well, Judaism, the law, was a religion because it was a works thing, based, of course, on faith, but nevertheless, Judaism demanded works, and it was a process, and we're going to be looking at that. They had to do this, and they had to do that. In fact, uh, you might as well drop back down to Exodus 19, verse 8. And that says it all. And all the people answered, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will believe. No, what? Do. And so they gladly embrace a works religion. All right. I think we can move on over into now chapter 20. And what is it? The Ten Commandments. Hopefully you've all learned them when you were kids in Sunday school or daily vacation Bible school. The Ten Commandments, which are causing such a furor today. Well, I've got mixed emotions. Naturally, they are certainly God's format for society. The Ten Commandments are still the basic law of God. I'll never take that away. But for us as Grace Age believers, you see, the law is moot. It's been crucified with Christ. But for the unbelieving world, it is still God's moral law. All right, now I'm not going to go through all the Ten Commandments. I trust you all know them, forwards and backwards. But here in Exodus 20 now, as the unfolding of the first part of this three-part covenant, we have the moral law, the Ten Commandments. Commandments. All right, now then, when you come on over to uh, chapter 21, in verse 1, we come to the second part of what we call the law, and it's the civil law, what I referred to, I think, in the last program. Now, in these succeeding chapters, and then on into the book of Leviticus, the civil law covered every aspect of human relationship with other humans. And as I mentioned, if you have an animal that's known to kill and you let it kill someone, 
then you were responsible for it. And all the way through, how you dealt with your neighbor in business transactions, morally, how you, how you behaved yourself in society, this was all covered in what I call the civil law. And uh, I think probably a good portion of Israel's 613 laws, which the rabbis concocted out. And it's interesting to see how much of Israel's civil law is a part and parcel of our own Western civilization. I wouldn't doubt that when the British, way back in history, put together the Magna Carta, those men took a lot of their ideas from Israel's civil law, because after all, God was the one who gave it. All right, for just example now then, chapter 20, we start with the term judgments, which means in plain English, rules of government. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. Now this is aside from the moral Ten Commandment law. And all the way through now we have covering the various aspects of Israel's day-to-day -day experience within the nation. And you come through all these succeeding chapters. It's the judgments against uh, or to maintain society in the nation of Israel. Now I'm going to take you all the way up to the next part of the law, which is the ceremonial or the ecclesiastical or the ritual part of the law. Now remember, you've got the moral law, the Ten Commandments. You've got the civil law, how to deal with your fellow neighbor. Now we come to the ecclesiastical or the religious part of the law, and that is going to entail the priesthood and the tabernacle, which later became the temple. Okay, now I think we can come all the way up to chapter 24, where we now have what I call the third part of the Law of Moses. And uh, verse 3 of chapter 24. Now this is just this is just sort of scratching the surface. I expect a lot of my listeners to dig a little deeper. You can do all this instead of watching the stupid television. Get into the book and uh, pursue this a little further in all three aspects. But now we're getting ready to establish the worship or the, the religious system of the law. Verse 3, And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord. See that? God said it. And all the judgments, all these rules and regulations, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. Well, you heard that before, didn't you? All right, now then we're going to find that uh, verse 7. He took the book of the what? The covenant again. This mandate that God has now placed upon the nation of Israel. All right, so he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. So Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant. Now you want to remember that blood has been the intrinsic part of God's relationship with man leading up to the shed blood of Christ on the cross of Calvary. All right, now as we move on down in chapter 24, you can come to verse 12. The Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law, commandments which I have written, that thou mayst teach them. And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua, and they went up unto the mount of God. All right, now as Moses is up in the mountain then, starting in chapter 25, God begins to lay out to Moses all the ramifications of the tabernacle. All the aspects of it, all the materials of it, he lays out to Moses just as plain as language can make it. And uh, it was supposed to be built according to the tabernacle, which was already in heaven, and uh, this is merely a 
copy of it. Now, as you come all the way through these chapters of Exodus, we get to the place of chapter 29. Maybe I'm going too far. Maybe 28. Just a minute. But I want to start with the priesthood here, if I can. Yeah, chapter 29, verse 1. Exodus 29, verse 1. Now, you want to remember, in order to exercise the religious system that's going to center around the temple, the sacrifices, you had to have designated men to carry out all these systems of worship. All right, here we come. 29, verse 1. And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them that hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. See, now you haven't seen this before. This is something totally new in human history, that God is establishing now a priesthood. And they were to take one young bullock and two rams without blemish, unleavened bread, and so on and so forth. And then verse 4, And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shalt, watch this, do what? wash them with water. And that was one of the first processes of becoming a priest, was wash, wash, wash. And not only for entering the priesthood, but as they would begin to go through the ritual of accepting the sacrifices and stopping at the labor of cleansing and going on into the ministry of the temple or the tabernacle, before they could begin to minister, what did the priests have to do? Wash, wash, wash. Even though physical water could never take away their sin, yet symbolically it was speaking of a cleansing before they could step into the office of the priesthood. And so all of this now becomes then the third aspect of this covenant of law. First, the Ten Commandments, then the judgments or the rules and regulations of civil life, and then the religious system to compensate for their time and again failure. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries. 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1 These are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.